it's normal in the fact that in the last 12 months, you've probably forgotten this, but this is our fifth or sixth 20% pullback in Bitcoin. So you've dealt with this many times before. You just kind of forget it, which is weird. So has something changed in the business cycle that would tell us that we're going to have a failed crypto cycle? Well, in all probability, that's a no. So therefore, it's corrective price action. Echoing the prevailing market anxiety triggered by escalating tensions in the Middle East and soaring inflation in the U.S., the crypto market has been anything but stable. Bitcoin and other altcoins have plunged to fear-inducing depths and liquidated billions of dollars over the past weeks. Bitcoin closed April nearing a 15% pullback and fell below the $57,000 price level, but this didn't keep investors away. Raul Pal, who co-founded Real Vision and serves as its CEO, recently discussed the state of the market and what lies ahead for Bitcoin, the biggest cryptocurrency globally. Even though Bitcoin has experienced drops of over 15%, Pal, a financial expert, has pointed out an important pattern suggesting a possible bull flag emerging after the price correction. April has proven to be a challenging month for Bitcoin. Moreover, the broader financial markets have also encountered turbulence. The surge in investor interest in cryptocurrencies, which had been buoyed by the introduction of the first spot Bitcoin ETFs in January, has waned in recent weeks. Despite initial excitement surrounding the imminent launch of Ethereum spot ETFs, confidence has dwindled, contributing to the somber sentiment pervading the crypto market. Despite the recent downturn, Bitcoin has posted substantial gains year-to-date, up approximately 50%. Experienced since 2013, PAL acknowledges the discomfort of market downturns, but underscores their normalcy. He reminds investors that pullbacks are part of the journey, citing Bitcoin's history of numerous 20% corrections in the past year alone. Ready to uncover more insights? Remember to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications always to get our latest content. As I've always said, is crypto markets are volatile by nature. It's a 70% volatility asset class. It has deep drawdowns and it has tremendous upside. In fact, it's the best performing asset class in all recorded history. But with that best performance comes volatility. It's something I warn about in this don't fuck this up thesis, which is don't take leverage. Don't try and trade around or FOMO into stuff. Just be careful what you do and stick to the basics, stick to the bigger tokens. If you're going to degen into stuff, do it in the smaller stuff because that stuff's much more volatile. Your probability of getting it wrong is very high, although you can get 100x in the space as well. I understand that's attractive to many people, but I'm trying to keep everybody on the straight and narrow. And when you see these drawdowns, it always feels terrible. And I've been doing this since 2013, and they always never feel great. But the reality is it's normal. So it's normal in the fact that in the last 12 months, you've probably forgotten this, but this is our fifth or sixth 20% pullback in Bitcoin. And I think Coinbase put out a super interesting tweet, which was, there have been five Bitcoin bull markets. In an average bull market, you'll have to survive the following to ride it to the top. Six, five to 10% drawdowns, three, 10 to 20% drawdowns, two, 20 to 30%, one thirty to forty, one forty to seventy, and that's all during a bull market. So it takes a certain kind of gumption. It takes an ability to turn off Twitter, to turn off your screens, and say, "Has my thesis changed? Is the adoption of this technology stopping? Is there any other reason that it's going to slow down? Where are we in the business cycle?" I spend enormous amounts of time trying to educate educate you guys that this is a macro asset and it's driven by the business cycle. It just happens to be forward-looking like technology stocks and it's driven by the liquidity cycle. So has something changed in the business cycle that would tell us that we're going to have a failed crypto cycle? Well, in all probability, that's a no. So therefore, it's corrective price action. And if you happen to have extra money on the sidelines, use these corrections to add. That's what I did. I was lucky enough to have a bit of cash. Starting next month, the Federal Reserve, Fed, the Central Bank of the United States, will ease off on its quantitative tightening, QT, measures. The Fed said in a statement that it would slow the decline in its holdings by lowering the maximum monthly repayment of government bonds from $60 billion to $25 billion in June. Additionally, as anticipated, 
the benchmark interest rate remains unchanged. In its recent announcement on the 1st, the Fed disclosed that it had unanimously opted to maintain the benchmark interest rate at a steady range of 5.25% to 5.5%. This decision comes following a routine meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee and marks the sixth consecutive freeze in the interest rate. According to Raul Pal, the reason crypto is so volatile mirrors the instability seen in the tech sector. Liquidity, plain and simple. While the Fed has been reducing liquidity through quantitative tightening, QT, actions like the Treasury's reverse repo and Treasury General account have somewhat countered this effect. Now, let's redirect our attention to a video. What's going on now? Why is crypto so shaky? It's the same reason tech's been shaky. It's liquidity stupid. Remember, I've told everything about this everything code cycle. And those of you in Real Vision Pro um, Macro, and even Pro Crypto, Kevin Kelly and myself talked about it yesterday in Pro Crypto, liquidity is the big driver of all asset classes, and particularly crypto. It's the most receptive to liquidity injections or withdrawals. So I correctly managed to time the bottom in 2022 based around the liquidity cycle. And the forward-looking elements of the liquidity cycle continue well into 2025. So I don't have anything to concern over. So therefore, we're looking at the wiggles in liquidity. And those of you who follow Mike Howell, who's on Real Vision frequently, he also follows liquidity. He's probably the expert on liquidity. And he talks about the liquidity air pocket that I've looked at as well. The liquidity air pocket What's happening, if you think about the US liquidity, it's driven by the Fed's balance sheet, which they've been doing QT, so they've been tightening it, making liquidity less available. But that's been offset by the by the Treasury, no, by the draining of the reverse repo. The reverse repo is an offset to what the QT was doing. And in the meantime, the other part of the equation is the Treasury general account, which is the checkbook of the US government that Janet Yellick controls. And she's been building that. But these have meant the liquidity based back in 2022, and it's been going vaguely higher. The Everything Code cycle taught you that there is no way of financing the debts. It's now become a, a word people use, fiscal dominance. This is the Everything Code cycle I started talking two years about. The Everything Code cycle says, well, if GDP growth is too slow, then the amount of debt in the system um, is too high. So you need either interest rates to come down or you need growth to go up. Now, growth is driven by demographics over time. There's not much we can do about that. You get cyclical growth, but you don't get the overall trend rate growth, which has been slowing. So the available GDP has to pay the interest on the debt between the government sector that's 100% of GDP and debt and the private sector is 120% in debt. So we've got not enough GDP to cover the interest payments. This gets really exacerbated when interest payments are high. Trend rate of GDP growth is about 1.75%, call it 2%. Uh, whilst um, interest payments right now are, let's say, two-year bonds are 5%. Okay, and if you double that, taking into account the private sector, you've got 10% of interest payments and, and nominal GDP growing at whatever it is, 5 So there's not enough GDP, which is why the bond market's been freaking out. Over time, yields have, have risen, even though the Fed have been talking about cutting rates. And this is the issue of not having enough GDP growth. This is the everything code cycle. So what it leads to is what's known as more cowbell, which is stimulus. Stimulus can come in a number of ways. So the most obvious way is reducing interest rates themselves. That has been a typical path. The other way is the backdoor mechanism of injecting liquidity into the system. Quantitative easing is the best known one. The other one is draining the reverse repo and also draining the Treasury general account. So those are, tend to be those, and then there's some more coming, and I'll come into that in a sec. So where are we today? Why did we have the air pocket? Well, QT was going on, so they're selling bonds. The Treasury had started building up cash reserves because tax payments have come into the system. They come out of money market funds and go into Janet Yellen's checkbook, checking accounts, and that's taken liquidity out of the system because she hasn't spent it yet, so it's just sitting there. She's been trying to help the market by issuing short-dated bonds. That's drained the reverse repo. But now today, the market's reversed very quickly. After dropping to the $56,000 range, Bitcoin has swiftly rebounded, reaching the $63,000 range and showing signs of strength. Furthermore, it has sustained its market dominance at 53.3% for several days, prompting other cryptocurrencies to follow suit with a surge in prices. 
With Bitcoin's recent price recovery, traders are now eyeing the possibility of Bitcoin surpassing the $100,000 milestone. Considering its performance in March, when it set an all-time high of around $73,000 reaching $100,000, doesn't seem overly challenging. How feasible is it for Bitcoin to surpass the $100,000 mark, given its recent performance and market trends? We welcome your insights in the comments section below. If you found this content valuable, don't hesitate to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to stay informed. Thank you for joining us on this journey.